Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's National Geographic Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Really excited for today's Hangout. So today we are joined by Bob Ballard. Bob is a National Geographic Explorer in residence and one of the most accomplished and well-known deep sea explorers in the world. He's best known for discoveries like hydrothermal vents, as well as historic shipwrecks around the world, including the Titanic and the German battleship Bismarck. During his long career, he's conducted over 150 deep sea expeditions, always using the latest cutting edge exploration technology. In 2008, he secured his flagship uh, for his exploration, the Exploration Vessel Nautilus, and it's operated by the Ocean Exploration Trust. And on board the Nautilus, they're able to broadcast their adventures all over the world. So Bob, it's so great to have you joining us here today. I know you've got some adventures coming up, including a journey to Canada, and then the new adventure season with the Nautilus will begin soon. Absolutely. Uh, let me uh, come on, on camera initially, and then what I was going to do is to uh, start off with a, a description of what we're up to right now, because we're really, really busy. Our ship of exploration is in dry dock right now in Ensenada, Mexico, and we'll be coming out and heading out to sea in May and we'll be out at sea for seven long months, touching and going, changing out our core of exploration. So uh, let me start here and bring out an image and I can show you some images and then we'll, after I get done with that, we can then actually uh, talk. Let me put on my glasses and find, there they are. So uh, now I want to be able to share that or, okay, are you able to see that? Not yet, Bob, so hit the green share screen button and then pick the option for your whole screen. You got it. Now, how's that? Let's see if that works now. Does that work? We got gotcha. you, full screen. All right, everyone, as you can see, I wear a lot of hats, not only the one on my head right now, which is the Exploration Trust. I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Oceanography in Rhode Island. I'm also a senior emeritus scholar at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where I build a lot of my toys. And then as you just heard, Joe said, actually, Joe, they've said, changed my name. I'm no longer an explorer in residence. They named me an explorer at large. I think it's because they thought in residence sounded like a caged animal. Now, when I began my career, I began it in deep diving submarines. I started out as a naval officer uh, and that submarine on the left was as close as you're gonna get to Captain Nemo's Nautilus. It's called the NR-1, and it can go underwater for a month at a time. It can actually has wheels, it can drive around on the bottom, and it has windows. So it's a very, very unusual submarine. But most of my time was spent in the conventional submarines that you see. But then I got sort of tired of going up and down in an elevator, because when you make a deep dive, like that uh, one, that white Bathyscaphe Trieste that you see in the upper middle, uh, when I went to 20,000 feet, it took me six hours to get down to the office and six hours to get home at night. So I was spending most of my time in an elevator and I decided I wanted to spend more time on the bottom. So I dreamed up a new system and this is the Nautilus, uh, which uh, as Joe said, uh, uh, my trust owns and operates and it beams your spirits. We don't go down physically anymore. Uh, we send our spirit down and we go inside well, in many ways, like our avatar, and we use our own vehicles. Now, this is a big program that we've been doing with Canada, with Ocean Network Canada, off of Victoria, because in that area of the world, a, a, a crustal plate is going underneath Canada. And if that plate suddenly goes, it can set off a tremendous earthquake that can cause a tsunami. And so working with uh, my Canadian colleagues in University of Victoria, we've been wiring that entire uh, plate area. That's where you see those lines and then the little red dots are where we have different ocean bottom uh, observatories. And one of them, my favorite is the upper right, it's called Wally. And that's a little robot that's actually wired all the way, not only from the bottom of the ocean, to Canada, but from Canada to Germany. And German scientists are able to operate Wally uh, in real time, hardwired all the way there. But one of our primary missions is for the United States government. And so a little history to give you a background. In 1803, as you can see, Thomas Jefferson paid $15 million to Napoleon. He 
he picked a fight with England and lost and he had to pay up. And so he sold America what we call the Louisiana Purchase, a vast amount of real estate uh, that he then went and explored. And their team was called the Corps of Discovery. And they went in 1804 through 1806 to explore this vast part of North America. And I think all of us would agree uh, acquiring the Louisiana Purchase was a pretty good deal. And it, it doubled the size of America. And as you know, after that, we began to uh, occupy it, creating national parks like Yellowstone National Park. We went on to have ranches and farms and mines and all sorts of activities uh, to help drive the economic engine of our country. Well, now, in, uh, if we go forward in 1983, President Reagan picked up a pen and for the price of a pen, signed the Law of the Sea Convention and did exactly what Jefferson did. He redoubled the size of America. We call it the New America. As you can see, oh, you own all the way out 200 miles, and if you can prove your continental shelf goes even further, you can claim that as well. So all of that uh, yellow-green territory is half of the United States, but Unlike Jefferson, Reagan failed to follow up with a modern day version of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So it wasn't until 18 years later that President Clinton and President Bush agreed that there should be an office of ocean exploration and it should be designed to explore this vast amount of underwater real estate. The same is happening in Canada. Canada is claiming large stretches of land off their shore as well, and we're helping them with the Nautilus explore that part of Canada. Now, these are the studies that were done. I served on both of these presidential panels and commissions that led to this great program. And then in 2009, we had two ships come online, one operated by NOAA, the one on the bottom, and one operated by my trust, the Nautilus, to go, or we should say boldly go, where no one has gone before on planet Earth. So these are truly exploratory platforms. But when you go out with these platforms, you don't know what you're going to find. So it's very much like operating the emergency room of a hospital when you don't know what the ambulance is going to bring in Sunday morning at 2 o'clock because we operate our ship 24 hours a day. We have three different complete teams on the ship that go on for four hours. They get eight hours off, then they go four hours again. So we run 24 hours a day, four on and eight off, constantly exploring with our undersea robots. Now, these are the primary robots that we use. The one on the left is called Hercules, and the one on the right is called Argus. And Argus's job is to light up the underwater world for Hercules. So here we are in our command center down on the lower left, uh, where we have a team of engineers in the front row and a team of students and teachers. We take lots of educators with us. So I hope the teachers that are watching will think about coming out on the Nautilus. And when you hit the age of 15, you can start coming out on the Nautilus as well. But when we make a discovery that we see on our screens, we push those buttons in the upper right hand corner and we put it on a satellite and we send all of that imagery back live to our inner space center at the University of Rhode Island. And we have students sitting there 24 hours a day, just like they are on the ship. And then we can use this magical new internet that's growing around the world called Internet 2 Level 3. And this makes it possible to build remote command centers anywhere we want to build them. We have it at universities, we have it at, at schools and, and libraries. And this way you can actually participate live in our exploration. Now, an important part of our operation is our team. Now, I mentioned that Lewis and Clark call their team the core of discovery. We call our team the core of exploration. But unlike Lewis and Clark, which had only one woman, Satyajewea, we have 
mostly women on our team. 55% of our core of exploration are women in positions of leadership and authority. And we also want to make sure that all the faces of our society serve on our core. So a child can find their face on our core of exploration and know that there's a place for you when you grow up. We also have complete television production studios. I'm not only an explorer at large for National Geographic, I married National Geographic. My wife, Barbara, is a television producer and she helps us with the productions that we do live from our production centers at the Inner Space Center. And we also then, as I said, bring lots of people out to sea with us because we want to mentor them and, and, and get them ready to go for this exciting adventure of exploration. And then we put them in the hot seat. We have lectures on the Nautilus all the time. And then when we're on station, you can see all the different faces. I like to point out that the young lady in the middle at the top is my daughter. Emily Rose with a button nose and the young man just below her is my son, Benjamin. So my children go to sea with me as do my wife. So this is a very family oriented operation. But during the course of our mission, we will change out our crews one after the other after the other. And by the time the field season ends, we will have more than uh, 250 will have sailed on the core. So this is my slide I'm gonna end with. Uh, with my presentation, but now I want to come back and let's see if I do this right. I should be I'm back on screen. Am I back on screen now, Joe? You just have to hit the green button one more time for us, Bob. All righty. Here we go. How's that? Uh, I'm hitting. Ah. It keeps, yeah, it's, it's a pop-up menu, so it's getting away from you. Just try one more time in the corner. Okay, how's that? There you go. We got you All back right. now. We're back live. All right. Well, super. I wanted to give you that introductory uh, to what we're doing, but as you can see, we do all sorts of things. We, we don't know what we're going to find. We could find something biologically interesting, geologically, archaeologically. Now, when we find something, we call people and we network them down to the bottom of the ocean. But there's only one thing that I've reserved especially for me. And that is if we find a UFO, I get to be the one that explores it. Because if I find a UFO, then I won't have to talk about the Titanic so much anymore. So, all right, Joe, let's have them fire some questions to me. And I may not make them out, so I may ask you to repeat them for me. So let's go. No problem. Well, Bob, thanks so much for sharing a little bit about uh, the project you've put together. It, it's, it, it is really amazing and bringing so many people out to the ocean and then bringing it to everybody is amazing. And especially bringing so many women uh, in those fields and giving them the opportunities. It's pretty awesome. Before we get started, I want to give a few shout outs. We have a great group of classrooms from Canada and the United States who are joining in live on camera, but we also have lots watching uh, live via YouTube. So if you're one of those groups on YouTube, send in your questions via the YouTube chat sidebar. But I'll give a quick shout out to a few classrooms. We have Simmons Middle School in Hoover, Alabama joining us, sixth grade. So we're excited to have you guys joining us. We've also got a few teach er, classrooms from Laurel Springs School, which is an online school. So we have students joining from uh, Texas, uh, from, let's see, Minnesota. And it looks like we even have someone, Tom, from Switzerland joining in. So Tom, thanks for joining us. So lots of great groups joining us. But let's join our first group. Let's go to North Bay. So in North Bay, we have a whole school joining us with Mrs. Larmer. How's everyone doing there? I bet you're pretty loud if there's that many students. All right, who's got a question for Bob? What did it feel like to go that deep? What did it feel like to go to that, that deep to the bottom of the ocean? Well, you get used to it. Initially, I must say I was apprehensive on my first dive many, many years ago, but now I've made hundreds of them. In fact, in some cases, I've lived underwater in a submarine for 30 days at a time. And it's sort of uh, like being in an underwater spaceship because you can't get out. Uh, you know, unlike outer space where you can walk in outer space, you don't walk where I go. 
because the pressure is so great. When I went down 20,000 feet, the pressure, my goodness, was 4,000 pounds per square inch. So you don't want to get outside. Uh, but that's why I send robots now, because since I can't get outside, why don't I just send my spirit? Because my spirit's indestructible and it can move at the speed of light and I can stay down indefinitely now with my robots. So I, I really, I must say, I like, I like diving now with robots because I can, I can stay down there a long, long time. All right, well, we'll come back for another question from your group, but let's meet another one of our live groups. This time, there we go, let's go to Idaho this time. So I'm turning on their microphone. We've got a group Hi. with Mr. Windisch and their grades three to five in Coeur d'Alene. How are you guys doing in Idaho? Yeah. Whoa, really loud. All right, who's got who's got a question for Bob? So, uh, Sophia, you can ask first. Um, why did you start deep sea exploring? Well, I'll tell you why. When I was a little boy, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. But shortly after, um, I was, I'm a pretty old guy. My, I was born six days after Pearl Harbor, and my father packed the family up in, in, in a car, and we drove to California because he was a test pilot during the war with a crazy guy called Chuck Yeager. And shortly after we moved and the war was over, we settled in San Diego, right on the ocean. And I read a book called 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And I decided when I read that book that I wanted to be Captain Nemo. And that's why my ship's named the Nautilus. So I basically had a dream to become an underwater explorer and I lived my dream. I, I never gave up. All right, that's such a great story, Bob. And I think that's so important for the students that if you want something, you gotta chase it, you gotta go after it and don't let anything stand in your way. All right, let's go to Oregon this time. We're gonna join Mrs. Evans' class in Haynes, Oregon. Uh, grade six is, let's see how loud they can be. <laughs> All right, excellent. Okay. Go ahead with the question. Dace, gonna go? Uh, really loud. Why do, you not want to, why do you not want to talk about the Titanic anymore? <laughs> well, it isn't that I don't want to talk about it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of what we did, but it wasn't my greatest discovery uh, in my mind because we knew it existed. We, we went and found it and that was cool. But what I love doing is make, discovering things we have no idea were there. Imagine that you're down 9,000 feet in a volcanic terrain. There's active volcanoes around. And you're driving along in your submarine. And generally there's not a whole lot of life down at 9,000 feet because there's no sunlight. And so there's no photosynthesis possible, in fact, we were led to believe that there was hardly any life in the deep sea because there was no sun. And so imagine you're uh, going across this terrain, rugged volcanic terrain, and you turn a around a, a, a ridge and there are thousands and thousands of giant worms, some of them 13 feet tall, sticking out of tubes and clams that are a foot across. And when you bring them up and you open the clam, it, it doesn't look like a clam. It, it, has, it looks like beef, it has human-like blood. And when you open up the clam, it doesn't have any internal organs. Something else is living inside its body. And it's a bacterium you did not know existed that had figured out over eons of time how to duplicate photosynthesis in the dark. And it now leads us to understand how life got a foothold on our planet. We knew it started in the ocean, but we didn't know where, now we know. And we now think that there are other places, not only in the universe like Earth, but places even within our own solar system where we should find life. In particular, a moon of Jupiter called Europa that we think has an ocean covered by an ice canopy. Now it won't have buildings and cars and all of that, but we believe that if we can get through that ice canopy and go down to that bottom of the ocean, 
we believe there are active volcanoes and we should find life outside our planet for the first time. And there's a launch that NASA is going to do in 2020 to find out. So it's coming around. And so I think that that is pretty cool. Absolutely. And I think that's a great little assignment for classrooms is to spend some time today researching hydrothermal vents. And it's pretty darn amazing. You can find some great videos, some great information. And Bob, one of the classrooms just wants to know, um, do you know offhand the name of the worms and the clam? Because they want to research them after. Vesimentifera is the name of the clam. I'm trying to remember what the name uh, of Just say, go Google and say tube worms at hydrothermal vents or, or giant clams. And you'll see the pictures. They're pretty amazing. I'm a geologist, so I'm, I'm not really good in my lab. Perfect. Well, there you go, classrooms. I want to hear all about uh, what you research today and learn about hydrothermal vents. Send us some. Yeah, some look at the pictures on Google Image. They're amazing. All right. So we're going to our next classroom now, Mrs. Munn's group. Let me turn their microphone on. They're joining us, grade sixes in Brucefield, uh, Ontario. How are we doing, Brucefield? Oh, come on. <laughs> We have some very vocal classrooms today. Go ahead with the question. Which question? Okay, so, Thanks a lot. What was your first initial thought when you saw like um, wrecks or clothing that people would have wore when boats or anything would have went down? Well, let's always imagine that the world I explore in, imagine that you're doing what I do. But you do it, let's say you did it uh, in air. So wait till it's really dark, go out at night with a flashlight and walk around and look and only things that you see are what your flashlight lights up and you suddenly switch over here and there's something you've never seen in your life and it's six feet away. You don't see these things coming. They're just suddenly there. It's like someone pulling back a curtain and you see something and it's very close. So it's always a little scary uh, if it's an animal that suddenly darts away or, a, or a, 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 a vampire squid that comes at your face and that's always scary. But it's when you see something that just, you don't even know what it is. And that's, I love doing that. I love discovering things on my own planet. I love being the first human being to go somewhere on earth, knowing no other human being has ever, ever been there before. And your generation, not mine, your generation is going to be known in a hundred years as the great generation of explorers because your generation is going to explore more of earth than all previous generations combined. So the age of exploration is not in your history book, it's in your future. And I wish I could stay around to see what you discover. All right, great question. This time we're gonna to go to Guelph, Ontario, Mrs. Steinhoff's classroom. All right, go ahead, boys and girls. Do you think the fire below the deck made the steel weaker and made the iceberg cause more damage? Could you repeat that, Joe? Uh, uh, it sounds like it's a question about the Titanic. Did, they're wondering if the fire below the deck made the steel weaker and that no. did more damage. No, that, that was not, it didn't even hit where that happened. No, the fire wasn't even much of a fire. People try to blame it on the fire, but it wasn't. It, it hit an iceberg <laughs> that it wasn't supposed to hit. Uh, it had very strong hull. It, but it was, remember back in those days in 1912, they didn't have welding technology like we have on modern ships. The, the Titanic was literally stapled together with rivets. So imagine, but click, click, click. It was stapled together. And when it hit the iceberg, the iceberg didn't move. It's so big. It had so much inertia of rest that they stoved in the side of the Titanic and popped the rivets. And it wasn't, the, it wasn't the size of the opening. It wasn't a very big opening. They knew, it was, they could calculate how big the opening was from the time it hit it to the time water came in over the bow. You can actually do the math. 
and they did the math. And so it was 12 square feet or a couple, you know, square, uh, four square, square meters. So it wasn't big, but it was stretched out over a tremendous distance. I mean, the average opening was just a few inches, a few centimeters, but it left the water in four of the compartments and she wasn't designed to let that happen. So it wasn't that, that there was a massive amount of damage. It was, it just, it unzipped her. All right. Uh, quick question coming in from online, Bob. Uh, we've got a student wondering, uh, I think they're in Minnesota, if you've ever seen a Yeti crab. I have, yes, I have seen a Yeti crab. Uh, they're really amazing. Uh, you want to go online and you can look them up because they're very hairy guys, you know. Uh, and uh, some of them are the hawk crab, named after an entertainer, I guess, who have a lot of hair. But yes, I've seen them. They are really, they need a shave. All right, excellent. Um, you know, many tools on the ROV that could do that for them? Uh, we, we could. We could just bring them up and give them a shave. And bring them up. Gotcha. All right. Well, we're going to Colchester, Connecticut, grade sixes with Mrs. Kranicki now. Let me turn her microphone on. Hold on a second, boys and girls. There we go. We heard you. We got you nice and loud. Yeah. All right. Who's got a question for Bob? Who inspired me? Yep. Who inspires you, Bob? See, I'm I'm dyslexic. And I didn't know I was dyslexic because uh, I was born a long time ago and the word wasn't even around and I probably couldn't spell it anyway. Uh, but I learned about it through my daughter, Emily, when she was going to school in Madison, not far from where you are. And through that, uh, it, I discovered that I was dyslexic. And so I had some tough times. I, my, my brother was the older brother was the real smart one <laughs> that I had to follow. And I just found that it was teachers that inspired me to keep, keep trying. Uh, I think that you're going to have good teachers, you're going to have bad teachers, and you need enough good ones to keep you get going. And I, I'm a curious kid. I'm ADHD. I'm full of energy. I probably was a big pain to a lot of teachers. But teachers were kind enough to take the time to j channel my energy. I have a, a son who, uh, who's also dyslexic, my son Doug, and I put on the mirror in his, in his bathroom, it said, my, my body is like a, 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 a race car. And when I learn to drive it someday, I'm gonna learn a lot, I'm gonna win a lot of races. So it was, it was dealing with my, my energy and dealing with my dyslexia that I had to overcome, but you know, it really taught me a lot. And uh, I'd say it was teachers and my parents who encouraged me to keep going. All right, excellent. Um, sure, lots of teachers like the teachers we have joining us today who are taking their classes outside in the world and, and teaching them all these great things and giving them these awesome experiences. So we have um, our final group joining us from Highlands, New Jersey. They are from the Marine Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, grades 9 through 12. So if you don't mind, if your teacher can just hit the mute button for me because we've got such a full classroom group today that the mute is just off of my screen so I can't reach it. So if you don't mind just turning on your microphone for me, uh, we're ready for you. Oh, go. Are we on? Go. Yeah. How's it going, everyone? <laughs> I can hear you guys. Who's got a question? What was going through your head when you realized you discovered the Titanic? What was my what? What was going through your head when you realized you discovered the Titanic? Well, let me tell you. Let's see. You live in New Jersey, right? Yeah. yeah. Come down to Washington, D.C. after May 30th. We're having a, an exhibit at National Geographic headquarters at their museum called Titanic, the Untold Story. What I was going through my head was it turned out that the Titanic really wasn't my mission, my primary mission. I was a Naval intelligence officer during the Cold War and I had a job to do 
which was classified at the time as top secret. And we had lost two submarines during the Cold War, the Thresher and the Scorpion, and one of them was carrying a nuclear weapons. And my job was to track those submarines down, find out what their reactors were doing, and find out where the weapons were. But I needed a cover story. So the Titanic was my cover story. Now, they, I can tell you this now because they declassified it, but they're going to tell you that story in full at National Geographic. So come on down after May 30th. It runs to the end of the year. And so I was terrified that I was going to blow my cover. And in fact, the Pentagon wasn't that thrilled when I actually found the Titanic. They said, Commander Ballard, you were supposed to just look for it. And so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, what was going through, that was going through my mind. Everyone else was thrilled that we found it. I was, I was thinking, what's the Pentagon going to think? Because I actually found this puppy and it drew a lot of attention from the world. But fortunately, no one caught on. And so uh, they've now declassified, and I can tell you the truth. So that's what was going through my head. Amazing. That's such an amazing story, Bob. And um, I can't wait to see that exhibit when it's ready to go uh, in DC. So definitely something for students to check out. So we visited all our classrooms. So let me jump online. And I definitely know that we have um, more from online. So we have a comment here from uh, a student in Texas at the Laurel Springs Online School. And Xander's saying that he'd like to be a deep sea explorer. So you inspire him and he's so excited to be seeing you online today. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Here's another question from Sue Pound. And she's wondering what uh, exciting technological advances have occurred over the, span the expanse of your career. Can you talk about a couple of them? Well, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, when I was exploring, it was like communicating with two cans and a string. I mean, it was very primitive back then. And what I have now is, is amazing because I can have out-of-body experiences. I, I, I now have the technology to go anywhere with my spirit. And, and so that's basically what the Nautilus is doing. When we, when we find something in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, and we need an expert there in minutes from, from anywhere in the world, our technology can now beam you down. And where we're at, in fact, your generation will probably spend more time mentally outside of your body somewhere else. I, I remember the movie Avatar where the war veteran Jake was taken into the operating room and there was a Navi laying next to him. And he laid down next to the Navi, and then all of a sudden he woke up inside the Navi. And you may not remember what he did, but when he woke up inside the Navi, he got up and ran out of the room. And they, they thought, oh, my goodness, we've scared this guy to death. He's terrified. And they went after him. And they said, Jake, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm fine. And they said, why'd you run? And he said, I wanted the wind in my face again, if you remember. And that's because he was in a wheelchair. He was paralyzed below the waist. And, and then he had legs. And he didn't care the legs were blue, green, and eight feet, that he was eight feet long and had funny ears and a tail. He had the ability to run again. 95% of the human race lives on less than 5% of Earth because we've evolved ourselves into a box. There's very few places we can go with our body, but our spirit can go anywhere. So what you're going to be doing most of your life is living in a, what we call in engineering terms, an end effector. Another thing, whether it's my robot Hercules or whether it's a clone of yourself, my goodness, it probably, you know, that's way out there. But you're going to be renting robots and moving your spirit in them and think you're in the robots. And that's going to be a big part of your life. So get ready to live outside your body. Amazing. I was just at a big, big education conference in Dubai and they had a huge area set up with all the different virtual reality technologies that are coming out. And it's, it's pretty, it's an exciting time and it's only going to keep getting better and better and more immersive. It's pretty well, amazing. It'll be, a real, it'll be a real video. It won't be a video game. Uh, I mean, you will be there. Uh, you will think you're there. 
And as we go, to, we're now putting 4K cameras on. We're going beyond that with, uh, with 8K. I mean, you won't believe because it's easy to fool your brain into thinking you're somewhere else. So get ready to get fooled. All right. Awesome. So I just want to give a quick shout out to the website. So boys and girls, if you go to nautiluslive.org, you can catch up on some of the adventures. You can meet some of the team. And right on the main page is a highlight video from the Nautilus's 2017 exploration uh, season. And there's some pretty great stuff. So definitely after we get off today, head to nautiluslive.org if you haven't before. You can see lots of clips and videos, see the team. And uh, then when things get going again uh, towards yeah, the end man. of the school year. In mid-May, we're going to be back at sea and that'll be live. And we can take your questions. We took and answered 30,000 questions last deployment. So go to that website. There's another one called OceanExplorationTrust.org, where you, if you're over 15, can apply to go to sea on the ship. Teachers can apply. Uh, we're taking, I think, over 50 students and teachers on our deployment this year. So sign up. Become a member of the Corps of Exploration. All right. Well, we have time for some more questions. So classrooms... Send up a representative to wave at the camera, and that's how I'll know to come back to your class that you guys are ready uh, with another classroom. So, oh, there we go. I see someone sitting in Mrs. Steinhoff's class. Let me turn the mic on. Yeah. We're ready for you. <laughs> What's your greatest achievement? I, I don't, that's a hard one. I think living my dream was a lot of work because, uh, like I say, it didn't come easy. And I had to overcome failure. Uh, you don't learn anything by being successful. Uh, you, you learn through failure. Failure is not something you avoid. It's going to come along whether you like it or not anyway. It's how you respond. Can you overcome it? And what you need to do is follow your passion whatever it is, mine was to be Captain Nemo. And so I had to overcome my failures because I didn't want to fail again. And so I kept trying. So I think that's the most important thing you can learn is follow your passion. And when you get down, knock down, failure is the greatest teacher you'll ever meet and figure out what went wrong and fix it and don't do it again. So that was my motto. Oh, get, another one I have is never get into the thick of thin things. Concentrate on the biggies. Excellent, Bob. That's such a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, that failure, everybody fails, right? From the best explorer, scientist in the world. And it's what you do afterwards and what you take from it, what you learn from it. It's such a good message for students. We're going to go back to North Bay. I can see someone at their camera waving like crazy. So Mrs. Larmer's group, your microphone is back on. What extent of training did he have to go through to dive that deep? Well, really, uh, not a lot. I mean, you have to be, you know, stay in shape uh, because you're going to be uh, in a, when you're diving in a submarine, it's very tiny. So you're going to, I sit Indian style. I can sit with my legs curled for, for some reason for hours. Uh, you, you just have to Kate, stay cool and, and the, it'll be cold. So you don't have to worry about that, but it's really just keeping calm. You know, uh, I've developed, I think also when I was, I volunteered to be a combat infantry officer during Vietnam, I was initially in, uh, trained in the army, uh, as an officer. And then I went into the Navy and certainly I learned to be calm under very stressful situations. So it's, I also played on team sports. I played college basketball. I think team teamwork is important. Uh, get involved in student government. All of the things that really prepare you to take on challenges and, and, and to remain calm under, under very stressful situations. That's when you quiet down. All right. All right. And I bet things have changed a lot too, Bob. I bet you... Um there's probably a lot more rules and regulations than there were probably back when you were kind of starting things, pioneering new things and things like that. There's probably a lot more rules and, and that well, kind there of thing. Are and there, there are and they aren't. You know, when you're out at sea and I remember I, when I went on a, 
in a Navy mission, my commanding officer, I said, what are my orders? And he said, sail in the interest of the queen. And I just stopped me and I said, we don't have a queen. He said, sail in the interest of the queen, which means you know what to do. I'm not gonna tell you. And so commonly I have no orders. I go out there and I deal with what I encounter. Awesome. We're gonna jump back to Idaho now because I see someone in a blue hoodie uh, waiting ever so patiently. So your microphone is on. What is the most recent thing you found in the ocean? Well, wow. I'm doing an interesting project right now that you can tune in and it won't be until November. But we're, we're working underwater along the coast of North America when sea level was much, much lower than it is today. And we think people walked along that ancient shoreline way back during the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. And we're finding a bunch of caves. And in fact, one of my fellow explorers from National Geographic, Kenny Broad, will be going in those caves to see if they, you know, what's in there. Uh, we, we think that they're today modern day habitats for lots of creatures, but we're people occupying these caves during that southern migration. We're working with a, a great team of archaeologists and anthropologists and geologists. So we found the caves. And so stay tuned and we'll see what we find inside them. All right. So Mrs. Kronecki's class, they just sent me a question via the chat. They're live on camera as well. But one of their students, her dad works on explorations in the Arctic with the Coast Guard. And he's wondering, uh, they're wondering, Bob, if you've ever done some exploration in the Arctic. I, I've, I've gone up to uh, uh, up to the Arctic Circle. I was at one time thinking of going after the, the, uh, the uh, on the Franklin expedition, the Erebus and the Terror, which has now been found. So I've been up in that neck of the woods. And speaking of the Coast Guard, right over my shoulder, if I over open that window, you will see the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. It's directly, a, I'm in New London, where we the sub base is and where they build nuclear submarines. But also this is the home port for the Eagle, their, their tall ship. But the Coast Guard Academy uh, sends cadets uh, as well as the Naval Academy out on our ship. So uh, the Coast Guard's a great organization. I hear, hear the reveille every morning when they raise the flag. Awesome. Um, Highlands, New Jersey, go ahead and turn your mic on for me. And actually, just to jump in again, Mrs. Kronecki, uh, they just posted again that her dad's at the Coast Guard in New, in New London. That's where her dad is right now. So that's cool. Pretty close to you then, right behind you. What? About 200 meters. <laughs> All right. Um, so with so many like new advances in science nowadays, what do you think is going to be the next big field that everyone's going to be talking about and trying to get involved in? Well, I mean, clearly uh, advanced robotics is going to be a big deal. But I think we're, we'll be continuing to explore the, the, the human body. I think the breakthroughs that we're going to make in, in medicine and, and understanding the function of the human body is a, is a, is a, is a, an exploratory frontier that will go on for a long, long time. So I, I think you're going to see a lot of that. Clearly, I think we're going to see a lot of discoveries, uh, not only on Earth, but certainly within our solar system. I can't wait to see what they find when they venture down into the ocean of Europa or even fly through the geysers of Enceladus and put, open their mouth and see if they capture bacteria with, the, with, this, with the space shuttle. Uh, that they're flying through the spacecraft. So I, I think it's, it's all over the place. There's so many frontiers. Uh, and, and, and we also uh, have a lot of people who are in, in the arts. So we, we take artists out with us. We take authors out with us. I, we don't uh, not only do uh, STEM, we do STEAM. We have tremendous amounts of uh, people involved in communications and media and, and production. And the way in which we can communicate now is quite amazing. We have a lot of challenges because there's a lot of false news out there that you need to be able to sort your way through. So the biggest challenge of your generation is not having information, it's processing it. You're going to have lots of information. So you need to have a very broad-based background. I, 
I quadruple majored in college. I majored in math, physics, chemistry, and geology. It was crazy. But it taught me a broad-based uh, education. I think that's important. You need to get a very broad base on which to base your life on Earth. Excellent. And that's obviously some more important points again. And boys and girls, if anyone ever tells you there's nothing left to explore or discover, just shake your head and laugh at them because we're just getting started. There's so, so much more for us to do. Uh, let's jump to our class, Mrs. Evans class in Oregon for a final Lexi. question. Lexi. What was it? Yeah. Lost nice love. About how many submarines have you ridden in? Wow. Uh, <laughs> lots. Uh, I would think over 15 different ones, nuclear submarines and bathys gas and submersibles and yeah, I, a, a, a bunch. <laughs> but I spent most of it in a submarine at Woods Hole called Alvin. Uh, but like I say now, I, I, I got my robots, so I'm actually getting more bottom time now than ever before. All right. And then one more question from YouTube, Bob. And I think this is a good one to end off on for today is what is something that's still out there that you really want to do? Where would you take... Uh, the vessel if you could, or, or what's something you're, you're still looking for? Well, the one I'm looking for is what I don't know is there. So that's always hard. People say, what's your, what do you want to discover next? And I, I, if I knew, I would know it was there. I like going out where no one has gone before and being surprised. So I get surprised a lot because we're underwater so much and we're trucking so much. So I just want to discover cool things. And I know they're out there because we've seen only 5% of the deep sea. So there's 95% uh, of the ocean that's full of surprises. All right. That's excellent. Well, Bob, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Thank you for uh, teaching us a little bit about what you do and the amazing uh, organization you've set up. I know there's going to be tons of classrooms excited to follow along the adventures when they start off again in May. And here at Nat Geo, we will be connecting regularly throughout your expedition, leading right into the next school year and, and sharing your adventures and your journeys and meeting some of your amazing exploration corp. So we're really excited about that. Um, and yeah, I know you've got some more adventures coming up along the way, but thanks for taking some time for all the classrooms today. I know they're pretty excited. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. And just remember, everyone, study hard. All right. Well, in a moment, I'm going to turn the microphones on, let the classroom say goodbye and thank you. And that might get pretty darn loud. Uh, but again, Bob, it was great hanging out with you. And we look forward to following your future adventures. So here we go, classrooms, nice and loud. If you guys want to say goodbye and thank you to Bob, here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys are always good at that. No question. Uh, you guys enjoy the rest of your school days. Thank you for the amazing questions. And Bob, we'll connect again soon. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. See you, everybody.